The spirit of patriotism is animated in beholding the development of the resources which have opened a new channel for industry and competition, which in their results may add alike to the wealth and comfort of the people. We rejoice in this day, not that we are rich, not that we are at ease, but in the conviction that this more expanded field of enterprise will be diligently harvested by the energetic exertions of our population. Hi, I'm Chuck Arning, Ranger with the National Park Service here in the John H. Chafee Blackstone River Valley National Heritage Quarter. And we're standing here on Depot Street in Farmsville in South Grafton. And back in 1827, it's hard to imagine just how active this area was. There was lots of activity here. Right over here was the Blackstone Canal. There were probably a thousand men working on the canal from Uxbridge all the way up to Millbury. And of those 1,000, 800 were Irish, a community of Irish canal builders who come to this country to start a new way of life. Now, just down the road here, a couple of hundred yards, and this activity doesn't have to stop over by the canal. Peter Farnham and his sons are building a four-story stone satin and cloth mill right here in the banks of the Blackstone, utilizing the power of the river to power their mill. So you can imagine just how congested this area was. ox strong carts pulling pieces of granite, new building supplies, a perfect picture of the young republic, optimistic, forward-moving, entrepreneurial America, with a community of canal builders and a community of millwrights and workers building a new country. But wait a minute, there is a community left out of the story. If you look across the Blackstone, you head up east to the top of Keith Hill, there's another community building America. They're tending their gardens, they're weaving their baskets, they're accomplished stonemasons and teamsters. And while they live throughout this area, the center of their community is at Hassanamisit on the top of Keith Hill. And they are the Nipmunk. And while they're left out of Mr. Pierce's history of Grafton, they've always played an important part of this landscape, this industrial landscape. And if you think about it for a moment, the workers here need to be fed. Were not the gardens of the Nipmunk appropriate food for these workers? And what about the baskets? Weren't they strong, usable for the workers here as well? Stonemasons and teamsters, that kind of labor was in short supply in America. Weren't they also part of this? Logic would tell us, yes, that the Nipmark were part of this industrial story. But in telling America's complex story, logic doesn't always win out. If you think about cultures with oral traditions versus written traditions, which one do you think survives? So why don't you join me as we begin to look at the Hassan this marvelous story of this community, look at the industrialization of here in the Blackstone Valley, and try to answer the question, were the Nipmunk part of this industrial story? here in Grafton, Massachusetts is a classic example of what a New England common should look like. Although to be honest with you, it looks a lot different today than it did back in the 1700s, where militia would drill here and cattle would be held here while you went to church or town meeting. But it has always been the center of Grafton, so it was a very fitting place for the May 2004 anniversary celebration of the purchase of Hassan where the Nipmunk people joined John Elliott in creating the second of John Elliott's Indian praying villages in 1654. The occasion recognized the strong partnership of many groups to help the trust for public land, and others purchased a sizable portion of Keats Hill that is known as Hasnamisit. This purchase brought together two very distinctive cultures that make up today's community of Grafton, who jointly celebrate their history with this historic property. What brought us together was a place called Hasnamisit Woods, which people will continue to talk about, which may be, we believe, the original site that John Elliot came and created his church and his village with the Nipmuc people, my people. The town of Grafton, the Trust for Public Land, 
the Grafton Land Trust have all been significant in making sure that this land gets preserved so we all can enjoy it. Not just my children, but your children and grandchildren forever. That's why we're here. We're here to celebrate our common history, our common story. We're here to celebrate the pain, the love, the joy, the suffering, all of it, because it's part of who we are together. Unifyly, we're here together. As the Reverend mentioned, it's about the beginning. It's the joining together, it's the remembering, and it's the moving forward. Whereas Hassan the Missit again saw the Nipmuc return permanently in 1698, where the Nipmuc have lived side by side with the European and English settlers to this day. And whereas Hassan the Missit is a uniquely American story about the interaction of native people with the first English colonists. The 350th commemoration of this event was festive, with traditional drumming, cultural sharing, prayers, psalm singing, speeches. Yet with all this celebration, there were still some questions. Most prominently, just what secrets lay buried in the soil after centuries at Hasnamisa? What could they tell us about our past that the history books may have missed? What lessons are to be learned? And what are the untold stories waiting to be revealed? Hasidamisa. It's an active archaeological dig site. And to the untrained eye, it may appear a bit chaotic. But remember, this dig has been going on for several years. Concepts and ideas have been proven and disproven as the earth reveals more of the past. Archaeology is often really dirty work, but it's also a fascinating process. It is a dialogue where students and professors alike share ideas. Ideas that are often wrong, but as each idea is proven incorrect, it serves as a basis for a new inquiry. It is a workspace that reminds me of that Thomas Edison quote, I have not failed, I've just found 10,000 things that don't work. I think archaeology is a lot like, like a mystery novel, you know? Like, you know, when you read a mystery novel, everything's like, like they write it in such a way that everything is super significant, you know? And sometimes I feel like we look at artifacts that way. Everything is, everything's a clue, you know? I mean, and I don't know, I don't know how, how, uh, how much of a correlation there is there, but... That's how I think about it sometimes, like a, like a mystery. So yeah, like CSI. Another way to look at archaeology is to think about crime scene investigators, CSI. Just follow the evidence. It's very often scientific work at its best. And we're going to probe the ground here to find out what it can tell us about the people who once lived here, worked, and played here. Fortunately, we have some very able scientists grad students from UMass Boston, the Fisk Center of Archaeological Research, and their professor, mentor, and director of the center, Dr. Stephen Mazowski. To lead us on this journey of uncovering, literally uncovering the past, and developing an understanding of what it can tell us about those who lived here, and the connection it may have had with our industrial landscape here in the Blackstone Valley. There's the stories that the local histories tell, which are um, sort of cherished stories that have been passed down through the community for generations. So there's those stories. And then there's the stories that the archaeology tells in and of itself. Um, and I think that one of the tricks is trying to sort of uh, find bridges between those two stories, but also try not to look at the local histories and then look for those stories in the artifact. So um, in some cases, I try not to find the stories right away. I try, I try to separate myself a little bit from those local histories. Here's one side, and here's the other <coughs> side. Then you just start to convince yourself that the corner's out there, and you just haven't uncovered it yet, ignoring an obvious corner that's right in front of you. Uh, so instead, that corner comes up like that and, and cuts over in that way. So the this is the second sort of 
foundation that they probably added when they expanded the house. And the beauty of that is, is that that means I would I would venture to say you know we don't know for sure, but that that house is the original house built by um, Sarah Robin Robbins and Peter Muckamuck. So that's about a 1727 1728 structure, which is beautiful. Just when you think you're finished, one of your students says, you know I I think this wall seems to match up with another wall that we found. And the more we looked at it, the more we realized that rather than have one foundation that wasn't exactly making sense based on what we were seeing in the field, um, we in fact had two foundations. We have a smaller one that we now believe is earlier, probably dating to about 1728, Sarah Robbins and uh, Peter Muckamuck. Uh, and then a later edition that probably dates to the period when Sarah Phillips uh, is, is, is living in the house and she's the mother of Sarah Boston, who that's the period that we have that's best represented, and that's from 1790 to about 1840. And you know, it's always important to, to keep in mind that when people are looking at documents from the 18th century, in this case, and somebody's saying, I need this money to build a new house, that doesn't mean a separate house. It just means an addition to their, uh, what is already a standing structure. So, okay, what's the boy. Yeah, the structure here, probably. Uh, gotta get these out. They're built all for each other. I liked the fact that you could really get a sense of the space of the building because the cellar hole was open. It's almost completely open. It was when they were, you know, at that, at that point in the excavation this past summer. So you could feel like where the main house would have been. The place that Sarah Boston, you know, might have walked across her kitchen floor. So that's... That was, that was the thing that, that kind of hit me the most. Well, I was really impressed, and I was thinking how, how lovely it must have been to live in that beautiful area when that house was actually occupied by the last person who lived there. Um, it, 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 someplace that I would have loved to have lived because I have a real affinity for the woods. I've always been drawn to the woods. What we have here looks to be the bottom of a, a large metal kettle and I just came across it while I was uh, cleaning up over here. This um, area between the rocks here is actually full of a lot of bone and a little bit of ceramic and other things, so um, it's not entirely surprising to find that here, but it looks to be a pretty impressive piece, so we're looking forward to getting it up. How does this site function in the greater Nipmunk family? Yeah. Ah, well that's a, that's a really good question and, and, and we feel that we now can draw a connection between this site which was occupied till around 1870. Um, it was still owned by uh, Sarah Boston's daughter, but she really probably just came here periodically. Um, it's at that same time that the Cisco family, which is the homestead that actually now is the Nipmuc Reservation here in Grafton, really gets started at their current site. So what we're thinking is, is that this site that we're on now sort of served as a community gathering location. And that changed in the late 19th century to the Cisco homestead. So we sort of have chosen to interpret the vast majority of the material culture we find here, which is a lot of ceramics, a lot of glassware, most importantly, a lot of utensils, which the numbers that we found on this site are much larger than we normally find. Usually on a, a site like this, of this period, you might find two, three, maybe five, you know, a couple of forks, a couple of knives, but here we're finding sort of 10 to 20 of these items. So that's a lot to have survived. What that suggests about the site is two things. One, that it probably was still being occupied up until a point where it slowly 
was allowed to deteriorate. And what, what I mean by that is, is that most of the material culture was probably still on the site. You know, it was just never taken anywhere else. So that's number one, so we're just lucky about that. But number two, it means that, that all of that material culture probably represents that, that, that uh, Sarah Boston at that time was doing a lot of entertaining and we, we, we were thinking of that as a sort of a community activity because there's a lot of exterior evidence of, of hearths and that sort of stuff that probably were people gathered and you know on a, on a, on a seasonal basis um, to sort of come together as, uh, as a people. So that's what we think this site actually was, like a community center. And if I remember correctly, there is also a, a similar site in Ashland. That's right. There's an earlier site that is uh, located on a place called Magunko Hill, and it's connected to one of the early uh, Christian Indian settlements called Magunkaquag. This is Hassanamissic, which was also one. Uh, Magunkaquag was also Nitmuk, but it looks that like that, that, that was a smaller community about... Uh, 40, 50 people, and it probably was occupied up until around the middle of the 18th century, but clearly not after that. But that community probably just sort of petered out around the middle of the 18th century, which is interesting because that sort of ends when this one is beginning. So whether or not we actually think of that as three successive Nipmuc community centers as you know, I don't know if that's we can make that connection, but it's possible that that we know that the Magunko uh, site that we found, which the, the, we found a structure uh, sort of like the one we have here, um, uh, and a dry laid foundation, no real evidence of mortar, uh, no interior hearth here. It looks like we actually now have an interior hearth, uh, but the earlier structure didn't. Um, but it's got that great combination of. European and English produced material culture and still Native American produced material culture that goes together that it's quite unique on this side. One of the um, really interesting artifacts that to me tells a really interesting story is uh, this one here. It's a it's a little tag and I think it's made of lead and it says A. Ellis on it and at first we didn't know what this meant. We didn't really think about it that much. And then we went back and looked through the documentary record that we have for Sarah Boston's um, interactions with her neighbors and um, local business people. And what we found was that she had been doing a lot of business with a man named Amos Ellis, and he was a local blacksmith. So we thought, wow, that is so cool. We have a little tag that says A. Ellis that was probably left on a hinge or some kind of, some smithing object that, that he sold to Sarah. And I just think that's so interesting. And it, um, it really connects Sarah to her neighbors. And it you know, starts to build that story of community that's not just Native people separate, Nipmuc community separate from your American community. It's, it's more of a holistic view of the community together. Generally when we're working we want to preserve our wall structure as much as possible, keep the unit nice and straight, but when we have an artifact like this and we're going to leave, we've got to get it out. Yeah. It's not going to survive well exposed for you know, another year. So. Is that how archaeology works the day you're going to leave, you find stuff? It, it always works out that way. You always find many more things than you can investigate, and uh, oftentimes you'll leave with more questions rather than answers. So. Um, but it, it gives us a sense of purpose and it keeps us moving forward. Hmm. A lot of patience, huh, Johan? Yeah. <laughs> stumble upon a bit. I'm not sure I'd be good at this. You get antsy. You wanna you wanna get it out. But yeah, yeah. You start getting impatient. It's usually a good time to step back, step back and, and take a deep breath. Some nice pieces. That's a little piece of uh, mocha ware. 
So this would be like 1790 to 1810. Very popular. In England, they were called cottage wares because they were sort of a, uh, sort of a, um, I guess you would call it today, we'd almost call it retro. It was sort of like uh, trying to call back a, a, a previous era, you know, where, you know, in England where rural life was really sort of, you know, wasn't being sort of altered dramatically by industrialization and stuff. So they became very popular. I mean, I work as a genealogist as well, so it's always powerful to visit an ancestor where, where they lived, where they died, where they loved. I mean, it's always a powerful thing to know that they, they existed there, that they walked on that very spot that you're standing on. Um, so pretty much it's, I mean, that's how I feel all the time. Yes, so, I know, I do So, I mean, I think it's, I had mixed feelings about the dig itself because they're disturbing things and who knows what they'll disturb. I mean, I understand that it's just to sell a hole and, you know, maybe a garbage pit somewhere na nearby, but um, you know, it's, it's always distracting to know that they're digging up and what they might come up, come across. But um, I think that the end result of learning more about the history of our ancestors, especially our female ancestors, I mean, female heads of households, which is pretty much what our tribe is like now, female heads of households. Um, I think it's a good thing. I think it's um, encouraging and educating. I think it's, I think it's a good thing. So one of the really interesting um, discrepancies between the local histories and the archaeology is that we're finding uh, such a rich uh, collection of material culture. Um, when you look at the descriptions in the local histories, you find words like, um, like uh, th they'll say that it's sparsely appointed or that it's that low and little and dark and a dirty and things like this, like these descriptions of Sarah Boston's house are, are, are sort of biased in the sense that they're trying to build this picture of Native people as marginal, as, um, as somehow less than the Euro-American community or somehow outside of the Euro-American community, different, um, like Dr. Mazowski was saying. Um, but one of the really interesting things we've found in the archaeological evidence is the assemblage of material culture is so rich. There, there's pots, there's kettles, there's uh, furniture pieces, there's, you know, all kinds of uh, social dining ware. Well, what it looks like I have here is the bottom of a kettle with um, two feet on it. And we find a lot of kettle fragments, and we've actually found a lot on the site, but we haven't found anything with the feet or the bottom intact. So this is uh, pretty exciting stuff for an archaeologist, and uh, we can't wait to get it back and cleaned up and see what we can tell about it. And they found so many things that I'm, it's like, I want to put a picture of the families in there and go back and recreate. <laughs> That there are times in archaeology when you feel like you're getting insights and then there are other times when you really feel like you can put yourself there and see the way things worked and that and that's what the site really is like we've got the yard we've got the house we've got enough in the yard to see where people were and so we can see like you were saying a saturday afternoon a sunday afternoon a dinner maybe of 20 or 30 people gathering there maybe fewer maybe more don't really know um but one thing's for sure is, is that based on the analysis of the animal bone that we found, which uh, you know is going to look like pretty much any middle class household at that time, um, you know, domesticated items like sheep and pigs and cattle and other wild things like birds and uh, turtle. Turtle. We, we we know what they're eating. We know how they're preparing it. And we know how they're eating it too, because we've actually got all the stuff. So it's, it doesn't take much, you know, to really envision this gathering together of people. And I, I love your question about like a Sunday afternoon, because that's, that's really what we're probably talking about. You know, this wasn't every day. Um, and Sarah certainly worked hard. We know that she had that reputation. So uh, she probably liked to relax. That there are stories to be told about Nipmuc presence in the area that haven't been told yet and that it's coming through a tribal perspective, through uh, Steve Rosowski's work, through his collaboration with us, and our assistance in sharing our knowledge and him kind of confirming his interpretation of the space 
and, and the place and the artifacts to us. And then through understanding the possible or potential interactions with the Cisco homestead too, which would, which would be another level of, of understanding that still kind of needs to happen. I and mean, we know these people knew each other. You know, they were nitmuck, they're living the same town, they're two hills away. Um, do we have anything written down? It says, oh, went to visit Sarah Boston today, went to Veris visit Sarah Cisco today. No, we don't. But um, it's, it's, it could be assumed that, that they knew each other. So more visibility, a, a clearer and more um, internal or native perspective of our past that doesn't come from um, so much of a European perspective, I guess. And that, that's, that in, in and of itself is huge and, and really, really helpful. So I'm, I'm excited about that. And I, I love working with Steve. So he's, uh, he's learned a lot himself too, as I'm sure he's admitted about um, what it meant to be native over the last you know, three to 400 years in Southern New England. So it's, it's really good. And, and hopefully also influence academics in the sense that they, he can hit both Steve as an individual, then the work that he does, and then the students that he's working with. That's a whole new generation of educators that are coming out and or working, um, working archaeologists who are now changing the way that archaeology is done in terms of native places and working with native tribes. So that's huge as well. So we've, we've really embraced that. And I think, I think that's all just really good, good for the tribe. I think more just the broader umbrella of archaeology and archaeology and Native people working together. Um, it's been a discussion that's been going on for several decades, of, you know, on, on, a, on a very serious and widespread level across the country with different Natives. There's, um, there's less than 20 PhD archaeologists that are Native in the country. So helping make that turn where more tribal people um, widely accept archaeology as a way of kind of seeing into the past and understanding that native people and archaeologists you know can and should work together um, and not seeing archaeology as you know the demon that it has been in the past um, because if you understand anything about the history of archaeology um, it has been unkind to to native people over its history but i think that that's really changing and projects like this are critical to that change so just kind of, again, seeing the, you know, the positiveness of it. So that would be kind of a take-home message, I think. Well, this has been Ranger Chuck Arning of the National Park Service here in the John H. Chafee Blackstone River Valley National Heritage Corridor. And I find the work of the archaeologists to be totally fascinating. Admittedly, it's painstakingly slow and even very tedious at times, and yet they manage to uncover these treasures to give us a wonderful appreciation and understanding of, of those who've gone on before, how they lived how they worked, what they ate, what kind of community they built. Fascinating glimpses in the past that the archaeologist has allowed us to have a window to. Now to answer the question of whether the Nipmunk were actually part of this industrial landscape here in the Blackstone Valley, the answer is elusive. While clues certainly point in that direction, and logic tells us absolutely, we lack that smoking gun, we lack that certainty. What we do know, however, is that Nipmunk were here way before we were. And from the early 18th century, well into the 19th century, they developed a very vibrant and engaging community here at Haslamiset that was involved with not just the town of Grafton, but the border of Braxstone Valley. Now, will we ever know if they actually were part of the industrial landscape? Maybe that's up to that young archeologist, that aspiring, brilliant person who's gonna put that link together that shows, yes, that bunk baskets were sold to the canal builders, and yes, Stonemasons helped build the mill at the farm's head. We'll only have to wait for that to happen. But what we do know is that Nipmunk, the community of Nipmunk that was built here in the Blackstone Valley, here in Haslamiston and in Grafton, has survived in their homeland to this very day. They have always been with us. So until the next time, hope to see you in the Blackstone.